Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to pick the brains of a genius. That's you, by the way. Uh, this is Dr. Mariam Zamani, founder of MZ Skin, which we will get into in a minute. Um, so tell us what doctor, how long a doctor, what kind of speciality, and give us all the juice, please. So it's a big word. I'm an oculoplastic surgeon, which means that I focus on the upper third of the face. <laughs> I'm board certified and I'm on the specialist registrar here in the UK, which means that I have the highest standard and level of training in both countries. I started in the US, which is why I ended up becoming board certified in America. And then I moved here for love. And oh, God. I know, I know. And then I had to do some of my training over again in order to be on the specialist registrar here. I did a few oculoplastic fellowships, which is really eyelids, droopy eyelids, brows, um, anything from trauma as well as cancers and other sorts yeah. of, you know, lesions that need to be removed. And I had a lot of fun doing it. And in the Europe at the time, this was in the, you know, early 2000s. I didn't have access to dermal fillers in America, and we started using them in the NHS here. Oh, before America? Before Ooh. before it was mainstream in America. Right. And we were using it for people who had, had traumas or cancers removed, and they had had so many surgeries, and they just wanted yeah. something a little bit so, different. Yeah. And they didn't want to have another surgery, another downtime. And I was like, this is so fun. And I was like, wow, there's so much you can do before you go from zero to surgery. And that's kind of where my first foot went into learning about skin. Mm -hmm. Off the back of that, I did a dermatology certificate with Cardiff University and, you know, really wanted to incorporate the non-surgical with the surgical. And at the same time, I had my babies, had terrible melasma uh, and started my skincare journey and then launched MZ Skin in 2016, really. Was it, was it that long ago? It was, end of 2016, wow. by accident. I was the total accidental entrepreneur. I, was, I made it for myself and I had no <laughs> idea what I was getting myself into. But day to day... Day you're, day. you're a doc. No, day to day, I have a lot of jobs like you. Yeah. I juggle lots of things, but what would you I say love... you spend most of your time doing? So I split it. So I do, you know, in the morning, the kids go to school and I go to my office and I see patients till about 1 32. And then the rest of the time, I'm on with the team doing the MZ skin stuff. Doing the brand. And then I go home and I need to work out. Otherwise, yeah. I go a little nuts. Uh, and then I'm with I the kids. I have to do it in the morning. I wish I could do it in the But morning. my kids are grown up. They don't, I, I don't know, have to do school around six. Uh, see, I, I'm, I, even if I had no one at home, I would definitely not wake up at six to exercise, yeah, even I'm though I love six. exercise. I can't do it in the evenings. I'm the opposite. Yeah, my when I finish work, I'm like, like I'm done. finished. I'm done. The bra is coming off. The hair is going up and I'm going to be horizontal. I'm done. What time do you go to sleep though? Um, well, last night I was in bed, like quarter past nine, went to bed about, sleep about half nine. That's amazing. Mm. I have, I'm usually getting home from the gym around that time. Oh God, no, no. <laughs> or we're, we're completely up, back yeah, to front. Yeah. No, 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 opposite completely. God, now when you're in clinic, what kind of uh, patients do you normally see? So I see everything. I mean, I have, I love my patients. So my my practice is really enjoyable. I never wake up being like, oh my God, I have to go to work. I really enjoy it every best? day. It's, honestly, it's I'm so lucky. I yeah. feel so fortunate that I really love what I do. Yeah. And I could be friends with a lot of the people who come in, but most of my patients, say probably 80, 85% are women for the day-to-day -day stuff. And then surgery is about 30, 70, you know, 30 men, 70 women. Okay. So I see surgical and non-surgical. So the surgicals are usually upper and lower eyelid blepharoplasties, having a droopy eyelid, sometimes the brows here, you know, you have beautiful arched brows. Sometimes people's brows are heavy, uh, lacrimal gland issues. You know, like We're going to talk about that because if you're, if you're a long-time viewer, you know that I had my eyes done. I do think it was 2016. I think it was 2016. Um, but they both need doing again and we're going to zoom in and the doc is going to show you what we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> fun. And that is fun for me. So like, that's really exciting. And Cutting people's eyes open I is fun. It's so much fun. <laughs> it's really like my Zen, you know, Zen wow. zone. Zen zone. That sounds funny. Yeah. But yeah, like my Zen zone. I love being in the operating room and I love that I do so many other things. So I do the surgical, then I do the non-surgical, whether it's injectables, things like neuromodulator, Botox, Dysport, Azalore. I do not lots of dermal fillers. I do yeah. dermal fillers more to tweak things. Mm -hmm. Not really. Uh, I don't do like whole faces with lots of different volumes. Yeah. Mine's more about like making subtle changes or improvements, whether it's like an acne scar or like an earlobe is deflated or a little oh, contouring in the nose. You know, like little things that can really make someone's confidence feel better. And then I love lasers and light and energy based treatments yeah. because. I think there's just so much you can do and not everybody wants to have surgery. And so there's just a breadth of stuff that we can do. And also because I suffer from pigmentation myself, 
Mm. You wouldn't know it. Your skin's fantastic. Well, I mean, I had two kids. I had terrible melasma. And still every year after summer, it's oh, yeah. really, you Insane. know, like I'm, I always, no matter what my skincare regimen is, I literally have to see the sunshine outside. Yeah. And yes, and it, and it sort of comes out. And, yeah. I, and I do everything. So I have a sort of passion for that too. I, uh, last year we were in Italy and Jim looked at me and he went, well, times have changed. And I had a baseball cap on. <laughs> my hair in a ponytail. I had a baseball cap on. I was under an umbrella. <laughs> I had my legs covered with a towel. And I was covering myself in SPF and then I'd get out the pool um, and recover. And he was like, are you feeling all right? <laughs> because when we first met, I'd just be like, you know, I know. It was a long time ago, kids. A I long know. time ago. I know. I'm the same way. I mean, I used to use a tanning bed. I mean, how terrible Tanning is that? beds and then foil. In the foil? 80s, we were sold foil. Oil? Oil and foil. Oil and foil. And, then, and hold the things under your chin. I'm like, I, I did all of that. I remember my mother being like, what are you doing? This is so bad for you. And yeah. And I had a few little freckles. And, you know, when you're young, freckles look so cute. And then they become age spots and they're not so cute anymore. Great. I know. So let's focus on, not to make it about me, but let's do lacrimal gland, which if you explain what it is. So essentially, when I had my eyes done, I had really droopy, heavy eyelids. If you don't know, we'll put a link below to the original video where I talk about it. And it was affecting my eyesight. Yeah. To the point where I went to the NHS and they did put me forward for surgery on the okay, NHS because they said it is affecting your eyesight. Um, but obviously the wait list was going to be, however, and at the time I was like, I'm going to get this done. And then it was only after I had it done that I realized how bad they'd been. And it was only when I was talking about it on my YouTube channel that I got upset because, and I was like, I don't know why I'm crying, you know, because I hadn't cried at all, but I, I had it done. And then when I, when it, when it calmed down, cause obviously there was swelling and, you know, and I, Jim said something to me about a week or two after the surgery and I looked up and I realized I could look up and see him without having to do this. That's so nice because my eyes felt lighter and it was it was like I'd been wearing a beige baseball cap for a few years because you can see it yes it was it's like hanging literally like you hanging a, over it interferes with your field of vision and and actually it is a medical condition and it is done on the NHS when it gets that bad because you know in your field of vision you see everything but then imagine you know a, a lot of times today I saw a gentleman and you know he was talking to me like this yeah and he said so do you think I'm ready and I said you know you 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 actually yeah. created a head tilt so that you can see better because you're tired of constantly lifting constantly up your Constantly doing eye, eyelids. constantly like this. So when I went for surgery last time, the surgeon said, this isn't droopy eyelids due to excess fat. I think you've got a lacrimal gland prolapse. Explain what that is. So we have lacrimal glands on the side of our eyes. They're responsible for our tears. Tear ducts, yeah, kind of. Basically, yeah. So they're the ones that make all the water uh, when you cry. And we, everybody has them. And they're usually tucked in, sort of beneath the bone. And in some people, were you an eye rubber when you were younger? No. Did you have allergies? No. So but sometimes... I think I think mine is, this is going to sound gross, but we are very violent vomiters in our family. Oh, yeah. And I've had four kids, yes. three of which were a vaginal birth. I'm just going to put the word put out, that there. out there. <laughs> um, one was through the sunroof. I could have just said it that way. One was through the sunroof. And then there was three. I don't like to use normal deliveries because that's just hard. You know, we don't use that terminology anymore. But... So three traditional births with a lot of, you know, pushing, pushing and face pressure. And then and when... weight changes also affect it, too, by yeah. the way, because the tissue expands and goes back. Yeah. So, you know, remember everything in our eyes, especially the lower eyelids, too. So we have thin connective tissue here up above and they're there to hold everything back. So there's yeah. lots of different layers in the eyes, in the skin, everywhere. And so with time, with age, eye rubbers, people who have a lot of, you know, yeah. strength training, family history, big um, Definitely chronic, family you know, history. predictor too, that can actually become stretched and the bits that are being held back come forward. And sometimes you see it in lower eyelids, you know, people get puffy and that's yeah. because the fats come forward. It's like gray hair. Everybody gets it eventually. eventually. Some people get it in their 20s because it's, you know, somebody else in their family has it or they have a mm -hmm. pre-existing issue or it happens when they're 60, you know, plus it doesn't matter, but it's like gray hair. Almost everyone gets it. Now, the lacrimal glands are less likely to be that. It, family history obviously is a predictor, but because they're normally tucked in underneath the bone, and so, and some of them are slightly larger than others. Mm -hmm. And if you have had some stretching, yeah, then that tissue isn't being supported as well anymore. Yeah. And so, probably what the first surgeon did was try and tuck it in and then st uh, and stitch it back up. Stitch it nicely, not knowing that I'm a forceful face. <laughs> <laughs> not knowing that I'm like a forceful face. Forceful person. 
You're a strong mm. woman. Yeah, but even I don't. Your, even your muscles behind. Oh, your God, tissue behind. just terrifying. But so, what, explain what the surgery is. So. so the surgery is is basically you go into the eyelid crease, which is right here, and it's mm -hmm. beautiful because you actually have no scar right there. And that's opened up. A little bit of skin is removed. If you have any fat here or on the brow, that's removed. And then this is the lacrimal gland, this little puffiness. And they know I... what it is because every video I do, if it's someone new, they comment and say, are you aware you have something hanging in your eye? Aww. And I'm like, no, I've never seen it before. Thanks for that, Brian. <laughs> Jesus. But look down to the ground for me. So if I go like that, you can see like this little bit of tissue right there. It's like a fleshy colored tissue. It, Simon? Oh! <laughs> And that's the lacrimal gland. And so what we want to do is go through the same incision, tuck yep. that in, sew it back up. And then the idea is that then this will go in. And you don't really have any skin. I mean, you might have like a couple millimeters of skin. Feel free to get in there and um, chop it all off. But you can have a little <laughs> bit. But, you know, but that, that's that's basically it. This one's worse than the other it side. Is. And that's just why I like, sit on this side. Oh, this is really <laughs> side. So, But you know what? This is what a lot of people do because this looks like white. And the reason it looks white when you're, it's because it's pushing against the mm -hmm. skin, so it's moving, moving the normal like vasculature away. So it looks like a little bit white. That's why also when people have fat in their lower eyelids, sometimes it can look purple. Sometimes it looks like a little white discoloration, and that's normal. Yeah. And so the color, of course, you can hide with a little bit of like foundation. Yeah, I had to learn how to what eyeshadow shade to use and things like yeah. that. Yeah. But if it bothers you, I mean, it's more the contour I think that bothers you than actually the volume there right now. Yeah. You know, no. Like in terms of the color, it, it doesn't like, bother me that because I can't really see it. It bothers me because in every single picture, it's the first thing I see. I know. I know how that feels. Baggy eyelid. It's not baggy eyelid. It's a lack. It does get actually. It does get painful when I'm tired, or I've been crying. Yes. Well, that's because it's in use, and so you know that's that's totally normal. There you go. But oh, but it's fixable. Yeah. The problem is, is you're always on camera, so it's really hard to find a week of downtime. What is the downtime? Because my downtime was long time last time. Was it? Mm. Do you have uh, any underlying health conditions? No. So that's good. And you are you a bruiser? <laughs> I am now. Are you? I didn't used to be, but since I've been menopausal, post-menopausal, really? I am. Yeah. I mean, look, I just touched my leg the other day, and I'm just... Oh, yeah, you're still bruised. So to be fair, most people don't have much bruising when you mm -hmm. do an upper eyelid, but I was, I'll show you the pictures. Mine was down like this. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was not attractive. So that's unusual. And unfortunately, yeah, of course bruising, you can never tell. Yeah. You can never tell. And no. bruising and swelling, by the way, after you have surgery is totally normal and it's going to go away. It's just, it makes your recovery a little bit longer. Most people have swelling. I usually tell people, so we make the incision along the lash line, uh, eyelid line, excuse me, a skin crease line take that bit out and then you have a stitch there and I usually put a piece of tape here and a little piece of tape here to hold the stitch mm -hmm. some people get fancy and they take off the they take off uh, the tape there and they're they're hanging around with a little blue uh, suture sticking out and that's okay as long as no one trims it please why if you're, would you if your surgeon that leaves ah. a thread or a stitch don't touch don't, it don't, don't cut it because it's there for a reason because then I just pull it out yeah. in one go at the very end and so that's really nice it comes out about a week later and All I right. usually tell people you don't look that bad after surgery. You're like, oh, that wasn't so bad. Yeah. It's the next couple of days where it culminates. And yeah. usually the third or fourth day is when you look the worst. That's when you have a little bit of swelling. That's when the bruising comes yeah. out. And then you're like, holy moly, what did I do? Why did I do the surgery? And you're like, maybe I shouldn't have done this. And I always call that surgical remorse. Everybody goes through I didn't it. get that, you know. The only time That's I so got nice. that, because I knew I wanted it done. The only time I had remorse was how uncomfortable I was trying to sleep on my back and not turn uh, over you're, and sleep you're elevated. Face, uh... No, I'm a side. I'm generally a, a side person or a fetal position, sort of somehow I'm on my side. I, I am better at sleeping on my back now, but how long do you recommend you sleep on your back for? I just say for 24 to 48 hours. Sometimes yeah. in some people I actually give the, you know, if you've ever had cataract surgery or you know somebody who does, there's some clear shields that you can just tape on and so for people who are really uncomfortable we just give the shield and we say just put a tape on it so that oh, i'll do that so that at least if you move, if i do yes i'm like oh like oh my god yeah what so i'll do line like this and then go oh, oh, but, oh. But, but for that reason i usually recommend that people pad their eyes right before they go to sleep for the first night okay. one for pressure to yeah. help reduce swelling and potential bruising and two so that if they they don't feel stressed out that they're sleeping. So three pillows for one or two nights. Yeah. Look, if you don't do it, it's not the end of the world. It's just no, that it's you're definitely have doable. A, it's just that you'll have a little bit more swelling. Yeah. You know, for a no, couple it's definitely more days. it's definitely doable, and I don't regret it at all. I just got annoyed because I I also don't really remember when it came back. Yes. I don't. It was I, probably gradual. Yeah, I don't really remember what made it come back. It was just that I was like, oh god, it's back again. 
but it's nice. I mean, you look fabulous. And, you know, well, thanks very much. <laughs> What's your most common surgery? So blepharoplasty is my most common. Of course, like an upper and, uh, and upper a lower. lower. So in my younger group, I used to say I would never operate on someone really young. That mm -hmm. was usually like my little caveat. But I tell my patients now, if something bothers you more days than not, and there's something that can mm -hmm. be done safe, why wouldn't safely, you do it? Why not? Yeah. You know, wh why not give yourself the best confidence? I just did a blepharoplasty on a young patient who happens to be a friend, and she was petrified. And she's a friend, but she's like 20 years younger than me. Yeah. So she's early 30s, and she always complained about just a little bit of puffiness, not terrible, but she's somebody who does a lot on social media. Right. And, you know, she was petrified to do it. She really didn't want to do it. Even the day before, she's like, I don't know if I can do this. And I said, well, you know, the clinic's going to take your deposit regardless because now it's like 24 hours. And <laughs> Too late like, now. Okay. You paid yeah. the money. <laughs> she's like, okay, I'll do it. Okay. And then literally 24 <laughs> hours later, she's like, when's the bruising and the swelling going to happen? And I said, this is kind of it. It might get a little worse tomorrow or the next day, but this is pretty much where you're going to be. And I saw her today, actually. And she bounced into the room and she was like this is the best thing I ever did Aww. and she's like I have so much confidence like I haven't had eyes like this since I was 14 Aww. and she was so happy and that is just so rewarding for me I mean yeah. it really makes me happy it makes me happy that I gave her that without and I'm glad that she trusted me to do that because it's something that really bothered her mm -hmm. and in a short 45 minutes I was able to make her feel better about herself and yeah. that's really what everything that I do and this business of plastic surgery or aesthetics is about. It's about making you feel and look your best at any age. So you have the confidence to be the best version of yourself. It's not to make you look different. It's just to be the best version of yourself. Well, that's a nice I place mean, was, to leave it. It's, it's such a... It's I think we're going to have to do a round two. So if you have any questions for Dr. Mario, please leave them below and we'll get you back in to do like I a, a Q&A. Absolutely. Um, we're going to discuss product separately but thank you for that and i i'm very excited i'm ready to do my online yeah we need to come in i will thanks everybody bye